All right, welcome back. Uh, we are, what are we covering today? We're covering the first book of Kings, cha- chapter 1 through chapter 11. Yes. Um, the thing I found interesting, that I was very delighted uh, as I was working on the remodel today, was God's temple had fur floors and fur doors, <laughs> just like ours. <laughs> I never realized that before. There was a lot of cedar and a lot of fur. I'm like, well, you know what? Solomon had good taste. That's I've, right. I've always said that. And some of my favorite wood. So we start off here with um, essentially the decline of David. Dave, David is getting old and old and cold. Interesting the solution that, that his um, friends came up with. That's right. Uh, Agishag, Abishag, Agishag, the shooting knight. That's right. The hot water bottle, as Graham puts it. Uh, decline of David. So the thing that we were talking about a little bit interesting was, so, so as David is getting older, I think as we get older, um, it's hard to maintain that intensity. Hard to, especially maybe, I wouldn't know what it's like to be a ruler or a king, but I think I think you would get tired of, of all the squabbles and sitting in judgment of people, and, and you would probably be, be, be more likely to start maybe passing on some of those, those, those responsibilities to younger men that were willing to do them. And kind of further removing yourself from what's going on. And as we see what happens, there's intrigue in the court. That's true. And I think, too, he he was lacking a little bit in authority. Just because of all of his past things. He couldn't control his family. He maybe had a little bit of diminished um, honor with the people. And so that, in part, played to whether people listened to him as much as they... I think that's a really good point. And... What we were talk, kind of listening, talking to earlier was that um, I think it's a commonly thought, I know I used to think this, is that if um, when we commit sin, when we willingly uh, do things that we know are bad for us, um, uh, there's this idea out there that God is going to punish us for these things. He's going to, he's going to uh, um, put a heavy hand on us. Um, but what we kind of have be- begun to realize is that is that the, the punishment that comes from these sins is a consequence of them. And it has very little to do with God. If we um, drink and smoke 12 packs of cigarettes a day, the consequence may be cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. And how many people have cried out to God, my God, why have you done this to me? Um, but it goes deeper than that. Those are manifestations or, or I guess, outcomes of sins that, that everyone can see. I think the thing is, is that um, the the things that we do internally when we disobey God's law, it, it's like a, a callus. Uh, my granddad used to say he was a mechanic, and so he always carried his wallet in his left pocket. And he was adamant that I did that when I started. And I asked him why, and he said, well, you know, I've worked with my hands. I'm right-handed all my life, and, and I, I have so calloused and, and abused my hand from pounding and wrenching and skinning my knuckles with wrenches that I don't have a lot of feeling in it. And I can't reach in my back pocket and, and really tell sometimes if my wallet's there. But my left hand is much better. It's much less calloused and has more feeling and sensitivity to it. And the point that I'm trying to make is that when we, uh, if we, we, we can callous our souls uh, if we continue in, in deceit and, and lying and, and, and morally uh, uh, bankrupting ourselves, you know, time after time, disobeying uh, the commandments of God, we get to the point where we be- become callous like granddad's old hand and we don't have the ability to hear the urgings of God. I think that's very true. You, if you sin repeatedly or do the wrong thing repeatedly, it's like a muscle that has got scar tissue and scar tissue and scar tissue. And yes, you may be able to do things, but you will always have that weakness in that part of your personality, that weakness in your muscle. There will be a flaw there that it might be forgiven but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And that's the key thing. It might be forgiven, but it doesn't mean it, it go, it's without consequences. Right. You, you, can, you can harden yourself. So you can harden yourself by continuing in these sins to the point where you've lost something of yourself. And that's what happened to David. And it, it's, it can happen physically, you know, in manifestation of throat lung cancer. It can happen in, in just being so hard and jaded around people uh, that you no longer have the ability to be kind and compassionate and loving. And in David's example here, it was he, because of his actions of what he did with his best friend and, and stealing a man's wife, and he lost moral authority with his family. Yeah. 
And when his young, you know, his sons, when they found themselves, in, because how many times does a child growing up justify his actions? I know I used to justify some bad actions uh, that, that I knew my dad told me. And we do we not kind of brag about these things when we're talking about our youth? Oh, remember that time when we, we, got, we got drunk and, and we, we drove uh, drunk? Or remember that time where, where we did this horrible thing? And, and because it's many years have passed by, uh, we kind of play that off as, oh, that, that was a fond memory. But God doesn't see it that way. Well, and if you did it today, you would be ashamed. You'd be ashamed. So why is it? it it's why is it that we look back with there's fondness? bravado in the memory, but and there shouldn't be there. Anyways, it is yeah, forgiven, the, I guess. The point being is point is being. is I've done this before, and and talking about this, you know, really shines a light on it that those things that I've done that that I should not be proud of when I was young, you know, they can come off as in almost like you said bravado in a boastful manner with our children, and I'll tell you what. Um, I, many times when I had to was sitting on the fence and I had to make that decision between right and wrong, because if, if I could so justify it, if I knew that dad had done it, dad did that when he was a boy or when he was a teenager, dad used to race his cars, a street race, dad used to do all these things and dad used to smoke or dad smoked. And so he had, he could tell me not to do these things, but he had no moral authority. And those in you don't. You don't want to put your dad no, down here. No, and I'm not picking on my dad. I mean, I, I'm. I'm just, You're just meaning anybody with any anything that they've. Yeah, done, and, any and, story. And I have done the same thing, but it points out. I mean, we're seeing it, it's all King David's life is all laid out here, and and to see that, and he's lost his moral authority. So anyway, so there's intrigue in the court. So he's maybe not really hip on what's going on. He's probably enjoying um, his shoot a night bed warmer, and uh, not realizing that there's intrigue. So he, as we know, that the, that the, the kingdom has been promised to, King, to Solomon. That's right. His son. But what Adonijah happened? decides Ad, to set himself up. An older brother. As king. As king. Do you think it galled Adonijah that his younger brother was promised a throne? Yes. Rights of inheritance. We have so much in the Bible about the inheritance of the firstborn. Look at the struggles between Jacob and Esau. And it's not the first wife? Not the first wife. Yeah, it seems it might seem unfair. It might seem unjust to him. Yeah. So he takes it upon himself. He starts to kind of work behind the scenes and gain support of some of David's prominent men, Joab being one of them. Yeah. Um, and that he's going to um, he's going to install himself as king. That's right. But Bathsheba gets wind of this. Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, so she finds out and she's terrified because her her life it will be meaningless because in those days as a king. Um, if there was anyone that challenged the throne, that was a threat to you. Yeah. And, and you would dispatch them. That's right. Wow. So there's a little plan about how they're going to tell David. So they do. They tell David, hey, this is what's going on. While well, you didn't know what was happening, what are you going to do about this? So what does he do? So well, he so says, he puts Solomon on a donkey, right? Right. So bas basically... Parades him in town and shows that... Solomon is the king. David was still sharp. He knew exactly what to do. He yeah. he gathered. He 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 told get my get the prominent men. Yes. Get the people. Get the men that the people look up to. Get the the high priest and and get the prophet and um and and, and by putting his son on his on his mule or his donkey. Yeah. I mean that was like putting him in Air Force One. Yeah. I mean it it, it well, that was uh, <laughs> everyone knew what the you knew who the king was who the king's mule was and that was uh that who would ride it but the king That's and right. Solomon was riding it and so he David essentially because he moved quickly. He cut this off. Now it's a and I think the one thing that's nice is that they forgive Adonijah. Well, yeah, and the reason why they forgive him is because of what he did. You know, he grabbed the horns of the altar. You know, we have that was a uh, the city of refuge and all that. They were kind of they had to. But interesting down the road when Joab tried the same thing a few years later, David they, or Solomon didn't pay any attention to that, and he had him killed. Killed even though he was he should have technically. By following the rule, he he should have been safe in that city of refuge and grabbing those horns of that altar. Doesn't always work out the way it's supposed to, does it? It, it doesn't, and it's a rec it's a record of what happened. The thing that's kind of chilling here is so, right before when I guess when David is is making these plans to make sure that Sil Solomon is sitting on the on the throne, um, Abinijah, Adonijah, Adonijah, 
is having a meeting uh, with all of the the Confederates that he pulled over from David's side and talks to Bathsheba. A- and well, no. Oh, uh, you're before uh, that. Uh, before okay. this, I'm talking about um, you know they're making their plans and and a and a soldier comes in that they know because they hear a great shout, a tumult, as the King James puts it, and want want to know what's going on, and he tells them David has just installed Solomon as king. And every one of those men realize at that time that they're dead men. Yeah. That they have backed the wrong side, and it says they all fled to their own tents. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, interesting. Okay, so what do we have next? So Adonijah, he comes back, talks to Bathsheba, who goes and talks to Solomon. And Adonijah asks for a young lady's hand in marriage. So Adonijah is up to his old ways. Not a nice character. So he is, uh, he's certainly recognizing Solomon as king, but he has not, he has not had a heart change. He's been plotting this whole time. And by this act, it, it seems uh, innocent enough, but what he was basically doing was he was asking for, for King David's woman to take him as his wife. That, that, was, that would show the people to look upon that. That was a sign of authority. Right. That would have been almost um, I mean, that would have been true disrespect. Challenging, uh, really challenging Solomon's uh, right to be king. Well, Solomon hears of this and he's not having it. Yeah, For, forgave you once, forgive you twice. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and that's the well. And I think it's more than just forgiving. It's it's also a matter of um, you know you've got to draw certain boundaries, and this is one of them. Yeah, because before it was a disrespect to him. But now it's a disrespect to Solomon's father. Yeah. And, and so it, I, I think it, there maybe that's the, that's sometimes you can handle disrespecting for yourself, but if they do it to someone you love, it's it's a different matter. It is, and and I think in, in common, in kind of in combination with that is it's uh, there's a quote I can't think of it. I'm going to paraphrase here, but p- power or authority or power sits poorly on people we know or on friends or loved ones. It's an ill fit, or a prophet is is not without dishonor except or in his own home, and that's true. If you've been if you've raised been raised with someone, if you went to school with someone and you were high school buddies or grade school buddies, and this person goes on to be a great person, a famous person, maybe a senator or a, a great a- an actor or you know some celebrity of some sort, you it's hard to to idol worship. It's hard to really take them seriously. Like, but you know, I knew them back when. That's right. And and they um, cried when they skinned their knee. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it might be. Yeah. And do you not t- kind of think that? Well, I could have done that. <laughs> Is there not a little bit of envy and, and jealousy? You know, I mean, what what makes him think he's so good that he can be a U.S. senator? What makes him think he's so good that you know I I, I could have done that? And I think when you see a person like that no. su- succeeding, well, I think a lot of people feel that way. Okay. You are a, a, a strange phenomenon that you always see the best of people, but uh, not not everyone is that way. Uh, but I think that I think that's what was going on with the, with uh, with his older brother Adonijah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the, the hierarchy of um, of the oldest older son, you know, was so prominent. It must have galled him to see his younger brother ruling and and ruling with such wisdom and and um, and success and that's right and he was um he plotted and schemed for years and that's what he came up with and it was ultimately his undoing so i think kind of to summarize this whole becoming king solomon becomes king he ends up killing adonijah shimei joab and he dismisses abiathar from the priesthood so he does he does clean house a little bit and then he moves on and it's interesting is that uh david is holding a gr- few grudges against a few people, and and on as as we see David here dies here in in chapter two, um, goes on to give a, a a laundry list to his son Solomon of some uh, some fellows that he wants to be taken care of, bringing his gray hair to the grave with blood and and very literal. You know, he leaves it up with, to Solomon, but Solomon was also somewhat of a man of blood, but not like his father. Right. I mean, David had a lot of blood, and Solomon had, I mean, Solomon did have blood, but it seemed to be, he wasn't a man of war. He was a man, uh, more of an intellectual type, who was a man of blood when he just had to be. We have to pause. Our Woodstove guy's calling. Be right back. Sorry about the interruption. Sorry, we we have our our Woodstove guy coming, and uh, we've got... We'll we'll, uh, we'll press on here, and then we'll have to we'll have to cut it short here in a little bit. 
So Solomon marries Pharaoh's daughter from Egypt. Oh, yes. Solomon. So he had, what was it, 700 wives and 300. So interesting. I mean, there's a long story. There, there's a long thing in here is, is that God appears to Solomon. And I mean, you can read it yourself, but uh, and then Solomon's prayer and all of that. And the, I guess the interesting thing that I came away with is that, man, God made some incredible, extraordinary promises to Solomon, which he honored. Gave him they, all this wisdom. But they were conditional. They were uh. conditional. They were conditional on, and, and he, he even told him, the interesting thing is that God, when God comes and speaks to you, face to, you know, I wasn't know if it's face to face, so I don't really know, but we know that God spoke to Solomon. Would you, would you have your listening ears on? Would you be paying attention? Well, yes. And the interesting thing is the very sins that Solomon f- fell into that were his downfall were, f- God warned him specifically. He didn't say, stay out of trouble, Solomon. Well, what is trouble and what does that mean? But told him specifically, you know, about how uh, dangerous it was to chase, chase these foreign gods. And uh, it, it, so, you know, I guess the thing that, that so I think that the good po- the main point that I want to make here is that we're kind of trying to get to what does this tell us about the character of God? Is that all of these um, amazing gifts were given to Solomon, uh, and they were conditional upon Solomon doing what God had commanded. Um, Solomon was in a position of great authority. Um, what Solomon did, I mean, the thing that is so important, even I mean, our president today does not have. Uh, I mean, a tremendous, maybe a, a influence on the people like they once do, did. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you mean conditional or without consequence? Because he gave all these things and he did warn him, but even when Solomon used his gifts poorly, he still had them. I think it's both. It, it, it's, it was conditional in that I will rend the kingdom from you. That's true. He I mean, like the, he got the big one, right? That big condition. The interesting thing about this is we see time after time when 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 Solomon fell so far from God, yeah, and and God came to Solomon and said, you know, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. What keeps coming up that's so interesting to me was, but for David's sake, I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. But for David's sake, I'm going to leave one of your descendants even though he's only in charge of one of the families, but he'll always have a place there. I'm going to make sure, for David's sake, a man after God's own heart, look at the benefits received. Look, look, at, look at how much, how many benefits that Solomon enjoyed for God's love of David. That's right. Well, and it's fascinating, too, that David did so many horrendous things, but no matter what he did, he always repented and went back to God. He always believed in God. We never heard of false gods with David. But here with Solomon, we hear of false gods, false false altars. So um, a being a man after God's own heart doesn't mean being perfect. Right. The, the one thing that David didn't do is he, what they did was he owned his mistakes and he didn't follow the false gods. Solomon, I mean, if you want to read up into it and look at what it means to pass through the fires of Baal, you, it, it was sacrificing his very own infant children. Yeah. There was a... Was that Malak or... Moloch. There Malak. was a large statue they would have made with the fire burning and the red hot hands, and they would actually lay the infants in there. It was a, just an abominable, horrible thing. Um, uh, and, and that's how degraded, that's how, how far Solomon had fallen uh, from God. But the interesting thing is, is that... So what about parents today? What if parents um, are, are devout people and, and friends of God and spend time in prayer and, and are close and know him... Um, Will it go better for their children who may be non-believers? Maybe. How about their neighbors that maybe benefit from from God's favor on weather or crops or a hurricane? Maybe you know, I, who knows? Right. You know, we don't know these these things, but it we know that God doesn't change and He's consistent. And if He did it for David and David's descendants, a man after God's own heart, I'm sure that there are men and women after God's own heart today. Yeah. Um, that he would do the same thing for us. Kind of interesting. I'm sorry, I'm rabbit holing here. What, what's, what do you got next year? <laughs> I guess just that, um, so he married Pharaoh's daughter. And I guess I think this kind of plays into when we're talking about what does this whole, uh, te- the, the Bible tell us about God and his character was that this is happening. This again, doesn't mean that God thinks that this is great. As a matter of fact, God doesn't think it's great. If you're marrying somebody who believes in idols he doesn't think it's great. But as part of history, he's still continuing to bless Solomon. Um, 
he still allows Solomon to build the temple, which David had wanted to do. And the Lord had said, David, you have too much blood on your hands, but your son Solomon can build the temple. And so then it goes into quite a bit where even though he marries Pharaoh's daughter, he's still allowed to build this temple. I, I think that's a really good point. So Solomon taking 700 wives and 300 concubines, having this harem, what that was not God's plan for them. No. It was not God's plan for them to come in to be fighting all of these wars. Right. It was not God's plan uh, for them to have a king. These were all these things that are happening, all of these intrigues and these wars and battles. These were never God's plans. These were the children of Israel. Okay. This was the way they wanted to do it. They, they, they wanted to divorce themselves from God's plan, and they thought that they knew a better way. Isn't it interesting to think, instead of having a God, I will have a human king. I, I, like, when you look at it that way, you think, like, well, that's a bad idea. And you just know it's a bad idea. Yeah. Well, it's it's what they're looking around. They're seeing what everyone else does. And how short-sighted. I mean, we're, we're uh, I, I don't mean to pick on the children of Israel because we have the benefit of hindsight. We could be in this book and then 2,000 years in the future, people could looking back and be having the same discussion. Right. Because human nature doesn't change. But the thing that, that I think really paints God in a, in a positive light through all of this this dreadful history is that even though they were not following his plan, even though they were they did not go in and, and were not doing things the way that he ultimately wanted them to do, which would have been much better, would have been much less bloodshed, maybe no, none. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't he hasn't given up on them. Yeah. And I, I, I well, the thing that's so wonderful is that even after all of the foolish things um, and the how Solomon degraded himself and destroyed himself, um, God didn't turn his back on him. He even honored him so much to let him write another book of the Bible. Yeah. He told him to write Ecclesiastes. And as Graham said, that was so interesting. You know, someone, it was, let's say we had a pastor or a minister of a church that had fallen to the level, I don't know how you would, fallen to the level of, uh, of Solomon. I don't know, sacrificing his own children or whatever. But um, would he not feel lucky at the end of a career like that to be maybe just the janitor or, or mowing the lawn in the, in the church? But that's not how God works. That's how we work. But God sees the heart, and uh, he's not asking for people to be perfect. He's asking people to, to have a heart change and be willing to, have a willingness to listen yeah. and to learn. And so honored the man after all the terrible things that he had done um, to write another book in the Bible. Incredible. That, that says, says to me, it says a lot about the character of God. We say this, we say this all the time. How many times should I forgive my, my brother's sins against me? Seven times 70. How many times your neighbor borrows your truck and it comes back and it's smashed up? Comes back and, and, and it's got a broken headlight. Comes back and, and the quarter panel's all caved in. And that happens. How many times do you let that happen with your new truck? Seven times? Ten? Well, How many times there, there, you... there's forgiving and then there's just saying, you're going to have to rent one somewhere. <laughs> right, but I'm grateful uh, that it is not us that is going to be judging people in the final days, right. that this is a type of God, even though we throw sand in his teeth and we turn our back on him time after time after time, he doesn't get to the point where say, he says, that's it, you're not borrowing my truck anymore, you're on your own. Still, he continues to strive with these people and he continues to strive with us. A whole life wrecked uh, in rebellion to God and, and running away from him at that last moment. And this is not ideal, but we have the example of thief on the cross. That last moment, even after everything he'd done, he forgave him. Astonishing. It's an, you, as we were listening, we were listening to this book online today as we were working or on, on, a, on an app, and you said something like, I, I feel so sorry for God. Yeah. I feel so sorry for God that he has to, has to, to deal with this. And, and that's, I think that's something that I feel like I am just in the last few years understanding, instead of looking at God with, a, with an ac accusing finger, saying, why are you doing all these things? Why are you letting these, all these things happen? The grown-up view of this is, wait a minute, these things that are happening that we're reading here are consequences of people's decisions that have made outside of God. It's true. And still, he still works with them. Still works with him. 
And should we should we get back to our Bible? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We we'll, have yeah, probably time for <laughs> no, one. No, it's true. But I, I think um, uh, talking about in the first part of the book, I think it's important to talk about Solomon's dream. And one of the things he did do well was he asked for wisdom. And there's the story that everyone knows about the baby being cut in half. People appreciated that, right? He had made the temple. It's beautiful. He had the ark brought to the temple. The Lord appears to Solomon, which must be quite a thing you were talking about before. Mm. And then he has all this wisdom. He has all this wealth. The Lord has blessed him, blessed him, blessed him, and he decides to show it off. So people come to see, and the Queen of Sheba comes. Mm -hmm. And he's got all these foreign wives and... You know, you get just because you get a skill doesn't mean you use it well. Uh, that this would be the final point. I think that's an excellent point. Um, is that uh, God gives these gifts without they, they don't come with strings attached. He can give you a gift to have an, having a fabulous voice. You can use it in a way that um, uh, honors God, or you can use he'll he'll allow you to use that voice to to do death thrash metal the, the you know satanic type of music i mean you you can go either way with it the right. gift is yours god has given you the gift or the gift of administration um or or being having a good head for business you can run a a, a deceitful hedge fund or you can run a fortune 500 company that honors god and and with a commitment to customer you know all, you can go any way you right. want to but the point is is that it, he he gives them freely it's we have that free will we can determine which way we're going to go with it. Well, and interesting to see that he has this gift and he is not humble about it. And ha this, this I think, is striking to all of us in our everyday life, that we have certain things that we did nothing for, and yet we can be proud of those things. And it's not just that it's hard work or we've worked hard for something, but some things were just given. Yeah. And, yeah. and yet we need to remember our humility. Yeah, and uh, C.S. Lewis, I'll close with this, may, makes such a good point with this. Um, uh, a snail can, can neither really be good or bad. Um, uh, a dog can be a little, can either be a little, little bit better or a little bad or a little good. Uh, a human being, more so. Uh, and a human b being with great intellect, uh, more so. Yeah. You, you, th those gifts that you have, that, a, a dog that's given a gift can't, you know, a cow or whatever, you know, they can't, maybe there are some cows better than others, but, but the more, the bigger and larger the gifts, the bigger the intelligence, the bigger the intellect, the bigger the possibility of it going wrong. It's very true. And when we go all the way up to the pinnacle of it, uh, to Lucifer, the adversary, even him, given, uh, when we look, we can read about him and, and see how extraordinary God outfitted him. He was still given that ability. He could use that either way, in the presence of God. But what does that say about God, that he was willing to take a chance? I'll give it to you, even though you're a created being, and I'm omnipotent God. I don't have to do this. And I could give you a gift and say, I'll give you this gift. You can sing like Adele, but there are strings attached. You have to only sing in the church choir. And right. You have to only sing the old hymns, and that's your gift. Enjoy it. But he doesn't. Is that what God does? He doesn't. He gives us the freedom of choice. It can go either way with it. What does that say about God that gives gifts like that and then turns them loose? Yeah. It's pretty pretty extraordinary, isn't it? It's really extraordinary. Oh, it is. All right. Well, I think I think it's probably it for tonight. Anything you want to add? Nope. We didn't really get through all of your bullet points, here, did we? <laughs> Some days are just like that. You know, I, I think Mrs. W and I, I think we're just tired. We're a little tired today. We're a little tired um, today. We've been working really hard on the house. We have uh, some, we kind of have a deadline coming up with some friends coming over and we don't have to have it all done, but we want it to be reasonable, reasonable, yeah, yeah reasonable. So keep us in your prayers and uh, shall we close in prayer? Yeah. Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your people. I just thank you for the Bible and for these old stories. Thank us. Thank you for giving your Holy Spirit and showing us what your true character is like ask you watch over all those in attendance and and just let your peace and joy and understanding be upon all those uh, that are participating in this Bible study. We thank you and give these thanks and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.